Chapter Twenty of the King's Daughter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The King's Daughter by Pansy. Chapter Twenty. The Sad Funeral. Thy way and thy doings have procured these things unto thee. There are those to whom we turn instinctively when the house is full of mourning. They may not be those who are counted among our intimate friends when all goes well with us, but when sudden sorrow and consternation seem as if they would overwhelm us, there are certain helpful souls who seem to know what and how and when to do, and to them we look. Such an one was Del Bronson. She had not been intimate in the Burton family during their bright days, but no sooner did this stunning blow crush down upon them than she roused herself from the position of passive looker-on, and in that terrible night that followed not one in the house but learned how thoughtful and helpful and quiet Miss Bronson could be. So when frightened servants and anxious friends besieged Mrs. Burton with questions of what and where, she grew into saying, with a sudden lighting up of her bewildered face, Just ask Miss Bronson, will you? She can tell you where it is. Or, I will consult Miss Bronson and let you know. She has looked after these things for me. And Dell, finding herself useful, nay, actually necessary, stayed on, and did all those numberless things that relatives and more intimate friends could not be expected to do, besides many trifles for the comfort of this and that one that no one else thought of doing. Also the poor little bride clung to her, seeming to find in her quiet strength something like a refuge in which to hide away. She would give little answer beyond pitiful groans to the various perplexing and torturing questions concerning this or that article of mourning, until Dell, seeing that they were driving her nearly wild, came suddenly to the rescue, asked two or three concise, low-worded questions that could be answered by yes or no, and settled the points at issue. After that, they said when appealed to, as to what the poor young widow would like, just ask Miss Bronson, she will find out for you. Laura seems willing to talk with her. So it came to pass that Dell was much in the darkened room where the widow, who had been a wife for three hours, lay buried among the pillows. It was there when Mrs. Burton came in and went toward her daughter with troubled face. My darling, Mr. Tresevant has called for the third time. Can't you see him now, just a minute? He will want to know your wishes in regard to tomorrow. The young creature roused herself and turned her wan white face and great sad brown eyes on her mother. Mama, there is only one thing that I am particular about, and you can arrange that for me. I don't want Mr. Tresevant to have anything to do with the services tomorrow. Mrs. Burton stood aghast, and Dell paused in her task of bringing order out of the chaos of the toilet table, and turned toward her. But, my dear daughter, what a strange idea! Quite impossible to carry out. He is your pastor, you know. That does not make the least difference, Mama. I do not want to see him at all, and I will not hear him say one word tomorrow. But, Laura, why? What am I to tell him? You don't realize how very badly this will look. Tell him anything you like, and I don't care in the least how it looks. I am tired of looks. I don't care for anything any more. I am sure I don't know what to do, said Mrs. Burton, in despair. Miss Bronson, do you know anything about this strange idea? No, ma'am, said Dell, and her voice sounded hollow and unnatural to herself. Laura, dear, pleaded the mother, you will not insist on this, I know. It will make so much trouble and bad feeling all around. If you had an intimate friend in the ministry, it would be different. But Mr. Tresevant has always been so intimate here, and he was Chester's particular friend, you know. Laura's white lips quivered, but she raised herself on one elbow and spoke more resolutely than before. Mama, I am entirely resolved on this point. I never want to see Mr. Tresevant again. He was not a true friend to Chester. He had influence over him. He could have kept him from what he knew a great temptation, if he had chosen. There would have been no wine at our wedding but for him. When we talked the matter over, and I objected, Chester appealed playfully to him that he should settle the question. He answered that we certainly had an honored example, that there was wine at the marriage in Cana, and not one earnest word did he speak to help me. Do you think that I will have that man speak his empty words over my husband's coffin? Oh, but my dear, you are beside yourself, eagerly argued Mrs. Burton. Mr. Tresevant knew that he had no right to interfere in your affairs. That was a gentlemanly way of saying so. And as for the accident, poor darling child, it was a fall. No one was to blame, no one could have prevented it. Any gentleman might have had the same." While she was speaking, her daughter laid herself wearily back among the pillows, with a sigh so utterly heartbroken that it fairly choked her mother's words in pitying awe. 
After a little silence the poor girl spoke again. Mama, you might talk all day, and you wouldn't change my mind. I am fully determined. Arrange anything else as you choose. I don't care anything about it. Only remember, I will not have that man say one word. Mrs. Burton went away in despair, and ere long Emmeline Elliot came in, her face and eyes swollen with weeping. She had not seen her sister-in-law before that day, but she had evidently come now to plead Mr. Tresevant's cause. The young widow listened, or perhaps did not listen, to the eager arguments and expostulating words, returning the invariable answer, It is no use talking to me, Emmeline. I am fully determined. I told Mama so. Emmeline turned at last to Dell, with smothered sharpness in her voice. Is it possible, Miss Bronson, that you uphold Laura in this cruel and unladylike thing? For an instant Dell's eyes flashed, and it required all of her self-control and the remembrance of that crushed heart lying there among the pillows to help her answer in low, quiet tones, I have not felt called upon to advise Mrs. Elliot on a point wherein she did not ask my advice, but if she had, I should have said, if Mr. Tresevant is in any way connected with this trouble, his own conscience must be weight enough for him to bear. I would not add to it. Then she turned and went out of the room. It was but a few minutes when she was summoned in haste and dismay. Laura had fainted, and Emmeline did not know what to do with her, and Mrs. Burton could not be found. The doctor had come to make his morning call, and followed Dell to the scene of trouble. The next hour was a very busy and a trying one. The frail young creature was roused from one long death-like swoon, only to sink into another, so like death itself that sometimes their hearts fairly stood still in terror. When at last the doctor left her in a more hopeful state, he sought the mother and delivered his verdict. Mrs. Elliot's nerves had sustained a great shock, her brain was in a very excited condition, and there was strong tendency to fever. It was, therefore, exceedingly important that her slightest fancies should be yielded to, that her wishes should not be crossed in any way. She must be kept quiet at all hazards. Soon after that Mrs. Burton called for a private conference with Dell, and, with much circumlocution and embarrassment, made known to her that she desired her to communicate with Mr. Tresevant on the delicate subject. Dell shrank in pain and terror from the task. Oh, Mrs. Burton, she said earnestly, I cannot help him. It is not my place to do so, and I should not know what to say. My dear, I think it is imminently your place. You have been so constantly with our poor child since the accident, and you can represent to him her peculiarly nervous state, and the fact that she shrinks from hearing his voice in the service because of his intimacy with poor Chester. Mrs. Burton delicately ignored the fact that this was not the reason. You see, Mr. Burton's position, as an officer of the church, makes it an exceedingly difficult matter for him to manage, and I am sure I could never get through it without blundering. Now, my dear Miss Bronson, couldn't you be persuaded to add this to your long list of kindnesses? I assure you we will never forget how kind you have been to us, and you are so intimately acquainted with him. Meantime, Dell was thinking. She heard only a word here and there of Mrs. Burton's smooth-flowing sentences. She pitied, oh, so deeply and earnestly, the pale-faced, hollow-eyed young minister, who fairly haunted this house of mourning in his eagerness to be of some service. This added blow that was to fall, she knew would be a heavy one. She longed to avert it. Failing in that, would it not be less hard to endure, coming to him from her, told gently and with honest sympathy, such as she could give? Thus thinking, she let herself seem to be persuaded, received in silence Mrs. Burton's voluble thanks and assurances of never forgetting her, and went down to Mr. Tresevant when next he called. He came forward to meet her, gave her a cold, trembling hand, and then said eagerly, Dell, isn't there anything I can do? She shook her head. Everything is done, I believe, Mr. Tresevant. Then, by his next question, he precipitated the entire matter. I wonder when I am to see Mrs. Elliot to make arrangements about the funeral. Can you find out for me? It is quite time I knew what is desired. Straightforward frankness had always been Dell's habit. She knew no other way, so now she spoke quickly, yet with an undertone of gentle tenderness. Mr. Tresevant, they have sent me down to talk with you about this. Mrs. Elliot is half distracted. She shrinks from seeing any one, you among others, and they want you to make arrangements with Dr. Carswell to attend the funeral. Dr. Carswell, he repeated in a surprised tone, I did not know he was a special friend. What part in the service do they wish me to assign to him? They want him to conduct the entire service. 
Mrs. Elliot connects you so closely in her mind with her husband that she does not feel able to hear your voice, and they would like you to make arrangements with Dr. Carswell to attend the funeral yourself as a personal friend of the family. Mr. Tresevant stood before her, dumb with wonder, and with a heavy pain in his heart. What did it all mean? A friend he had certainly been to Chester Elliot, but not more to him than to almost any other young man connected with his congregation. A little influence he had possessed over him certainly, but he hoped he had some influence over all his people. On that principle was he never to be allowed to bury his dead? There was some mystery about all this. Dell, he said appealingly, what does all this mean? I don't understand it. Won't you explain it to me? Dell stood before him with downcast eyes and glowing cheeks. There were great tears in her eyes. She longed to flee from her task. How could she further wound the heart that she knew well enough was aching now with a bitter, unavailing regret? Yet she would not deceive him. She spoke in low, tremulous tones. Mr. Tresevant, you must remember that Mrs. Elliot has undergone a fearful shock and is not yet capable of thinking calmly. She associates you with her husband's condition on the night of the accident. She perhaps exaggerates your influence over him. This much she cannot keep her pitying heart from saying, and so just now it is painful for her to see or hear you. It is a heavy blow. It quivers through every vein in this sensitive minister's body. Dell feels it all for him. She fairly longs to clasp his hands and lay her head upon his shoulder and weep out her sympathy and her pity. But he doesn't know her heart. He doesn't see the unshed tears in those brown eyes. He is hurt to his very soul, and he is just as unreasonable as most other sensitive people are when something unexpected has stung them. Besides, he doesn't in the least understand the young lady whom he has asked to be his wife. So he answers her in tones as cold as ice, This is evidently your work, Miss Bronson. I hope you may be able to enjoy your triumph with a clear conscience. The tears in Dell's eyes have no disposition to fall after that. Indeed, they seem to have burned their way back to their source. Talk of his being hurt, he will never have any conception of how he has stung her. If, she says in her heart, if he really, after all that has passed, knows me no better than to think that I could do that, why then, what is the use of talking to him at all? So she lifted her eyes, stern now and dry, one instant to his face, and then turned and left the room. Have you settled the matter satisfactorily, my dear Miss Bronson? questions Mrs. Burton with both eagerness and nervousness, the exceeding impropriety of a rupture with their pastor, at such a time and under such circumstances, is of all things to be avoided. Dell even then is jealous for his honor, and understands him better than he does himself. She answers quietly, Yes, ma'am, he understands your wishes, but I think he would like to confer with you concerning the arrangements to be made with Dr. Carswell. Dell knows he will be his own proud self before Mrs. Burton, and the sooner he talks the thing over with the solemn dignity which the occasion demands, the sooner he will calm down. But she has been stabbed to the heart. End of chapter 20 Recording by Tricia G.